Hello and welcome to Capnography Basic EMS Review. This is Sean Halsman, Education Guy and Paramedic, and this is part two of the uh, two-part video that we're doing for Capnography here. Um, this is going to be good for your hour of sanity credit, and uh, we're going to get right back to where we left off, which is uh, using Capnography and in the various situations that we're going to encounter in the field. Uh, so, we had talked about movement of stuff earlier, and uh, the movement of stuff is important because, you know, we're getting air in and out, we're moving blood around the body, and, and this is how we're getting end tidal CO2 readings and how things are working out. So, uh, movement of stuff, in, in this situation, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, intubated patients and, and when you tube a patient. So, earlier we drew this diagram, we had oxygen here outside the body, and we had the oxygen going um, into the trachea, into the lungs, going to the heart, then we have the oxygen being transported through the circulatory system to the body, the Krebs cycle makes CO2, and then the CO2 is going to get transported back to the heart, and that's going to go up into the lungs and then out of the body. So O2 in, CO2 out, all that stuff is happy. So this is a normal, nice movement of things around. Um, when we intubate a patient and we are uh, doing breathing for them, we take responsibility for their airway and the things that they need to do. So here's a guy who has an ET tube in place because he was not breathing. We had a tube. So guy's in place. He's being tubed. Here is our bag valve mask, uh, which is not a very good drawing, but there we go. So in this situation, uh, we have put a tube in place. We have O2 that's going to be in through the bag. All right, that's coming into the body via uh, squeezing the bag. It's going into the lungs, um, but it's exactly the same process, right? So the blood's going to the heart. Heart is pumping it out to the body with oxygen. CO2 is occurring, and then we're going back to the lungs. And as long as we are bagging this patient, that stuff's coming back out through the 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 ET tubes, all right? So this would be movement on there. And what we're going to see with our capnography is we're going to see a waveform. We're going to see whatever waveform is there, but as we bag this patient, when they when the expiration occurs, you're going to see that uh, upstroke and down there, and then when we bag the patient again, you're going to see upstroke and then down there. So we're going to have a waveform if we are in place here. That's just what's going to happen. That's the normal process of the body. Now, let's get rid of this. Let's say that... Um, we intubate the patient, all right, um, but we're not very good at it, or we made a mistake, and we put this into the esophagus. So the esophagus goes over here. So the tube's down the esophagus, which is putting some air into the belly. Gurgle, gurgle, okay? Well, we're bagging. We may initially get some carbon dioxide out of the belly on the breathe out part because um, there is sometimes carbon dioxide in the belly, but it's going to go away. You're going to have a waveform that kind of looks like this. It's going to be oh, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and then your next breath is going to look like that, and then pretty soon you're going to have nothing. All right, uh, A flat waveform is really bad. I'm going to put that in here. Really bad. If you have a flat waveform, um, it means that there's uh, no air exchange happening, or at least no uh, gas exchange, uh, either because the heart has stopped or because you're not clearing the lungs out. So this is a bad situation, um, and we should immediately, after putting ET CO2 uh, equipment on our um, in the, in the tracheal tube, see that. We should know. I mean, there's no way for us to have a normal waveform if we are in the esophagus. So the most important use in uh, cardiac arrest or patients who are apneic is once you intubate, this is going to let us know that we have uh, a good tube or not. Um, so what's happening in the meantime? Let's say we don't realize, okay, um, you put your tube in here, you are bagging the stomach very well, and the stomach is responding with uh, some gurgling noises. Um, what, what is happening? Well, your, your patient's still producing carbon dioxide, all right, because it's technically they've just died or they've just stopped breathing, so the body is still using oxygen, so it's using up the oxygen that's in the system. It is producing carbon dioxide. Your blood is being pumped there if the patient's not in cardiac arrest yet, okay, but the CO2 is going back to the heart, and it's going up to the lungs, and where is it sitting? It's sitting in the lungs. All right, it can't go anywhere because your tube is not there. It's not being excreted from the body. So you're getting lots of CO2, lots and lots and lots of CO2, and it's just backing up here. All right, you're getting a ton of CO2. Over time, the oxygen is being used up as well, um, and we start to drop. So you're going to see a uh, an increase in the blood CO2. You're going to see a decrease in the available oxygen in your uh, pulse ox, so your SpO2 is going to drop, um, and and your ETCO2 is going to be zero. 
right? Because you don't have anything coming out of the tube. It's just, it's zero. So this is going to equal zero, and you're going to have no waveform. Um, and eventually, the body with all the extra CO2 becomes acidic. You get hypoxia, and eventually um, that patient's going to die. So that, that's that's pretty much what you've done. If you have not confirmed your tube placement, um, this guy is a dead man, and that's bad for our patients and, and really what not what we're looking for. So the importance of us using capnography on our intubated patients or any patient with advanced airway lets us know that we are getting a waveform and that we are getting lungs um, washed out with oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide coming out, uh, and that's why we use it for that. So always, always, always use this. It's required by Remac. It's required by pretty much any protocol anywhere. We're putting capnography on our ET tubes. The other thing that this does, once we're in, so let's say you intubate the patient and uh, the patient had a pulse and you intubated and then you're getting these nice waveforms that are happy and then all of a sudden it just stops. Okay, bonk. Um, if you lose your waveform all of a sudden and it's zero, one of a few things has happened. The patient has stopped breathing, all right? Now, theoretically, if you tube them, you're breathing for them, but uh, there's been a stoppage in breathing, so if the ventilator's on the patient, the ventilator stopped working. Uh, the second thing that could be is that the pulse has been lost, so this is an immediate, immediate indication of cardiac arrest. No more pulses, no more blood flowing, which means no more exchange of carbon dioxide, um, or the tube has been displaced. If you had a patient who's intubated, that could mean the tube is displaced. At any rate, if you have a loss of waveform at any time when the patient is intubated, you need to stop what you're doing and fix that immediately. It's it's extremely important. Um, there is a wonderfully horrible story about a young man who was uh, transported after a head injury um, down the Carolinas a couple years ago, and uh, he fell off a skateboard, had a head injury, and uh, for to make a long story short, uh, there was a failure on the part of the respiratory therapist to properly intubate this kid and without a um, use of capnography they had no clue that they weren't in and the patient crashed and the first thing they should have checked the airway is actually the last thing that they checked um, and unfortunately this child was uh, hypoxic long enough that he uh, was brain dead and he ended up dying from a situation that was supposed to be a uh, fairly simple and routine ALS transfer. As I showed you before, if you put this in the esophagus, um, you're going to get maybe a goofy couple of bumps here, but eventually you're going to get nothing because there is no carbon dioxide in the stomach. If you just drank a bunch of Pepsi, you'll have a little bit, but then it'll go away, and pretty soon you'll have nothing. So this is a pretty good indicator that you've had esophageal placement. If you fail to have a ETCO2 um, with a patient who's getting good CPR, who has a pulse, uh, and you have an intubation uh, situation going on there, you need to go back to your dope mnemonic here and try to figure things out. So displacement, obstruction, uh, remember pneumothorax, and equipment failure. Those are things that are going to keep you from bagging the patient or getting some kind of reading. So here's a question. What's the first thing you should do if a patient on a ventilator suddenly loses their waveform? So you're on a vent transfer with a patient with a pulse and they're sedated and then all of a sudden you lose the waveform. The first thing you want to do is check for pulses. Okay? Does the patient still have a heartbeat or do they go into VF or asystole or something else? That's the first thing that could happen and it's the easiest thing to check. All right? If they've got pulses, next you want to disconnect the vent and put the bag valve mask on that patient and start bagging and see if things improve. Can you get air in? Are you able to get the lungs to expand? Because if you can, it's a problem with the vent. And at that point, you're probably going to be stuck bagging the patient, but at least you're, you're okay there. Um, if you take the vent off, you put the BVM on the patient, and you still can't get air in, or you're getting air in and out, but you still have no waveform, then this is where you really need to um, assess the tube placement, whether it's going to be through a direct laryngoscopy or whatever. But um, uh, pulses and uh, compliance and no waveform is pretty much screaming at you. Your tube is in the esophagus. Um, and if you have any doubt, I would advise you to pull that tube, because this patient patient's going to desaturate. Uh, they're going to start to retain carbon dioxide, and pretty quickly um, we're going to find ourselves in, in a bad situation, and our patient's going to be in, in severe danger. So um, that's what you want to do if you find yourself with a uh, sudden loss of waveform. Let's talk a little bit about movement of stuff in low perfusion states. So cardiac arrest, um, shock patients. So uh, our normal stuff is happening. Let's say they're still ventilating. So we're still, we got oxygen out here. Um, let's say they are a cardiac arrest patient. All right, we're, we're bagging them. Um, we got oxygen going 
in and the body is still making CO2 and that's getting into the bloodstream and it's going either through compressions or some other means to to the lungs here and that's that's happening however you also have oxygen going through the bloodstream to this patient's or uh, body cells if you're doing CPR or if the patient's in shock um, this is going to be not good all right you're going to have very very poor flow of blood through the body even with really good compressions so what are you going to see um, if you're getting just little bits of carbon dioxide that are flowing through the body and back to the lungs you're going to get these sporadic readings in here and then you're going to have on exhalation your etco2 is going to be low because you're not really perfusing you're not getting good exchange of um, carbon dioxide or oxygen there and this is going to drop so your etco2 as it comes out is going to be uh, you know, somewhere in the range of 20, usually 15 to 20, uh, during a cardiac arrest with good, with good compressions happening, and that's uh, that's pretty much where you want to be. And you're not going to do much better than that. Um, in shock, it's the same thing. You're not doing compressions, but the cart the heart is not pumping blood enough. So you may either you've lost too much blood, or you have a cardiogenic shock from an MI or something like that. But you're getting sporadic return of blood to the lung tissue, and that is causing a um, a decrease in the amount of CO2 that comes out. Now, don't forget, the CO2 is still being made. It's just not coming out. So what's actually happening to your um, partial pressure of CO2. Well, in your body, huge, all right? We're still producing carbon dioxide. So we still have this acidosis state that's happening in a low perfusion state or in cardiac arrest. It's just that we're not getting enough perfusion to get the carbon dioxide out. So we have big amounts of CO2 happening inside the body, even though we're getting a low reading on the end title because only a little bit of it is able to get across. Now, in a cardiac arrest situation, um, we want to see at least 15 to 20 on our ETCO2 because 15 is kind of the accepted minimum that tells us we have some perfusion happening, that we're actually getting um, oxygen or blood to the lungs and getting things around there. Consistently low end tidal carbon dioxide during cardiac arrest will indicate a poor CPR. So if you see that initially, you get a 10 or lower. Uh, the first thing you want to do is make sure that your CPR is happening at the proper depth and the proper rate. Um, and it's actually been studied in many cases that right here, it, cardiac arrest patients who have an ETCO2 of 20 uh, millimeters of mercury or greater have a higher rate of ROSC. So if you have a patient and they're rolling around this area here, um, you're looking at a possibility of return of spontaneous circulation. That's where you want to be. Um, once you get ROSC, something interesting happens. Um, and we'll go back to that previous slide and talk about it in a second. But a sudden spike in end tidal CO2 during cardiac arrest usually tells you that you have a re return of, of circulation, you know, if not pulses. All right. Now, here's what happens. Let's go back to this one, actually. We had all this carbon dioxide built up in the system because we're doing CPR and we're getting poor perfusion, and all of a sudden the heart starts to beat on its own. Beat, 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 wonderful. This CO2 in the body is now getting moved to the lungs the way it's supposed to be, and boy, is there a lot of it. So what we're going to see in this situation is we're going to see a sudden spike on your ETCO2. So all of a sudden we have ETCO2 which goes up, might be like at 50 or 60 or even 75 sometimes, all right, because all this has been built up in the system. We're going to continue to bag this patient until the ETCO2 starts to normalize so that we know that we are back to where we're supposed to be. But this is the first sign of us having a return of spontaneous circulation. This can actually occur even before you feel carotid pulses. So the heart starts again. We have to increase the pressure in the body and start to perfuse, and then we'll get an increase in blood pressure enough to make pulses. But you'll see an increase and end tidal CO2 uh, with ROSC long before you'll feel a carotid pulse sometimes. So very important to know that. The other nice thing that uh, it tells us, uh, end tidal CO2 during cardiac arrest, is that if you are doing good compressions and you've got a good ventilation rate and you're you're getting a good waveform and you're only seeing like 10 or less, um, this is generally a harbinger that the patient is going to die. What this usually means is that uh, the body has become hypoxic to a degree that we've had cell death. So the cells are dying. They're no longer making carbon dioxide. 
um, and that because of that, there's just no carbon dioxide to get rid of. So this is a person who we're not going to get back. Uh, this could be a prolonged downtime, um, someone who wasn't breathing for a long time before they were found, been cardiac arrest for a while. This is this is bad news altogether. Um, if you have good CPR happening, uh, this can also happen if the patient has no circulating blood volume. So you get a patient from a mass, a massive MVA, you find them unresponsive, they have had an aortic rupture, uh, their blood is not circulating anymore; it's all in their belly, and uh, without any blood circulation, you're going to get very very little, even with CPR, you're going to get very little um, end tidal CO2 there. Um, in our protocols and in most things that you read, it'll tell you after 20 minutes of CPR, uh, patients with an ETCO2 of uh, 10 or below, even with good CPR and good ALS innervations, have a death rate of almost 100%. So most of these people are not coming back, which is why our protocols advise us um, with uh, 20 minutes of good CPR to uh, call for possible orders to terminate. Um, this is something you've got to decide on your own as a clinician. You know, if you have good CPR going on, if you think you've been doing a really good job with this and you're still only getting an ETCO2 of 10, um, you're probably looking at a patient who's who you're going to terminate this on. Most of the time, this is going to be a patient in asystole that uh, there's just really no hope to get them back, but it, it could be a different rhythm as well. Um, this is another video that I'm going to show you, and we're going to talk a little bit about hyperventilation with patients who are intubated because it's a huge, huge problem. And what the monitor does for you, we already know about the CPR feedback and the you know compression feedback. It tells us how deep and how fast we're going, and that's all wonderful. This also helps you to uh, manage your airway control and your breathing. Um, Everybody from the day one firefighter to respiratory therapists uh, hyperventilates patients in cardiac arrest. It's it's a stress thing. They, they go too fast. And when you hyperventilate patients, a lot of bad things happen. So uh, before we talk about those bad things, we're going to take a look at the monitor. And this is a patient who's, you know, being ventilated and they're being ventilated at an appropriate rate. They have a ETCO2 of about 30. Again, this is me ventilating myself. Um, so that's kind of my baseline and, and where I'm at most of the time. My respiratory rate is here. It's 10, 9, now I'm up to 32. So this is showing me that I have a reasonable ETCO2 and a reasonable respiratory rate. If we hyperventilate someone, they're going to drop this down into the low tw uh, mid-20s, low 20s. Uh, you're going to see a rapid rate here, you know, 24, 25. And that is definitely uh, an indication to us right there on a screen that we should probably slow down the bag and stop going so fast with that. Um, you can instruct personnel who are assisting you by looking at that and say, hey, you need to slow down, or hopefully the personnel who are assisting you can see that on their own. Now, what happens when you hyperventilate a patient? Well, let's take a look at a cardiac arrest, okay? Hyperventilation is a couple things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to increase intrathoracic pressure, all right? Every time you bag that patient, you fill up the lungs with air, and it increases the pressure in the chest. And what that does is this decreases the amount of uh, filling that the heart can do. So you're you're going to you're basically decreasing your preload the more time you spend with air in your chest. Decreasing the preload um, leads to a, a decrease in cardiac output because you've got a crummy preload, so you're not putting much stuff out. And what happens there? Well, that means that your brain, your central nervous system, gets decreased perfusion because you don't have good BP and good output. This also increases your jugular venous pressure, and that additionally will cause you to have a decreased uh, central nervous system perfusion. Bad stuff, all right? So we're not we're not uh, perfusing the brain because we have too much pressure in the chest. This is the other thing that hyperventilation does. You never knew there was so much science, did you? But it's in here. So this decreases your carbon dioxide. Why? Because you're blowing it all off. So it decreases the pressure of carbon dioxide in your body. Um, you're going to start seeing a decreased ETCO2 on your uh, end tidal. But what less uh, CO2 in your body does is it makes you become alkalytic, um, and this does some things. This will cause uh, global vasoconstriction of the blood vessels in your brain. Right? That's why we hyperventilate people who, a little bit, people who have head injuries because we're trying to decrease the pressure in there. But in this cardiac arrest scenario, you are once again decreasing the perfusion to your brain. Um, this also causes some uh, shifting of chemicals in your body, and uh, this is a calcium uh, protein influx into the cells, and what you get is what's called uh, apoptosis, and this is cell suicide. So basically, cells uh, go through this process. This is a uh, chemical mitigated suicide of the cells. The cells basically decide, hey, we're shutting off now, we're going to die. So we are killing cells, including brain cells, when that happens because of this process. And we are shifting uh, the hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin curve that we talked about before, and this is going to uh, cause 
us to hold on much tighter to the oxygen and not deliver so much oxygen to the central nervous system. So check it out. Five bad things, all different processes that will cause your brain to not perfuse if you're hyperventilating a patient. What does it mean? It means if we're having any hope of resurrecting this patient that we've got in cardiac arrest and we hyperventilate them, they're going to die. We're not going to get anything back. At best, we get ROSC, and then we have a brain-dead patient who has an anoxic brain injury because they were not getting perfusion to their head. So this is bad stuff, um, and we want to avoid doing hyperventilation as much as possible. We'll do another little diagram, movement of stuff, and we'll talk about pulmonary pathology. Um, this one's a little sketchy. So um, we talked about intubated patients uh, up until this point because that's what we're familiar with. And this is where we get a little bit into non-intubated patients. All right? So let's go back to the very beginning like we've done in the past. We have oxygen going into the body. We have um, the whole system here of taking the oxygen in, bloodstream, sending it to there, and carbon dioxide being produced by the body and going back out, and that's all great and wonderful. All right, so this goes in and out and things are happy under normal circumstances. If we have some kind of pulmonary uh, pathology, actually, let's talk about an asthma patient. So your patient's got asthma. They're experiencing a bronchospasm. All right, they're breathing in a little bit hard, but this is an active process uh, of the lungs and the uh, muscles to get oxygen into the system to the heart, and then the heart's going to push oxygen out to the body, the body's going to create that carbon dioxide and they're going to push it back to the heart and the heart's going to pump this back to the lungs. Now, ventilation, getting it out. We've got carbon dioxide sitting in here. The heart's doing a good job of getting it back there. We've got bronchospasm with our asthma. So our patient is having a hard time pushing the air out. So you're getting smaller amounts of CO2 leaving the body. Um, initially, when this starts to happen, the patient's going to breathe fast, and they're going to have a decrease in their ETCO2. So initially, you're going to see a patient with asthma have a ETCO2 that is decreased because they're unable to get that out of the body and through there. While that's happening, with all things, um, carbon dioxide is beginning to build up in the body because it's not being cleared properly. So again, we're talking about this acidosis that happens when you can't clear carbon dioxide out of the body. Um, this may actually normalize at some point. Um, in, in the process, we're going to start to see some increases in the CO2 in the body, and that's going to start to spill over because there's just so much carbon dioxide that we're going to start to see a regular ETCO2. And as this develops into really bad um, asthma, you're going to start to actually see an increase in ETCO2 because we have the body has so much carbon dioxide trapped in there that we're getting it out. And this is a patient who's in really, really bad shape. Remembering SpO2 and uh, ETCO2, you may see some of these changes before you see an actual change in the oxygen saturation. So again, putting a uh, finger probe on your asthma patient to see how well they're doing doesn't give you a whole picture. It only tells you a little bit about their oxygenation level, and your body can maintain oxygen levels much longer um, than it will uh, tolerate increased CO2 and the acidosis that comes into play there. Uh, the same problem also occurs in COPD. Uh, COPD, you have air trapping. So basically the air is being trapped in the alveoli. You can't clear it out. And during exacerbation states, uh, the same process is happening. We have a buildup of carbon dioxide in the body. We have decreased our carbon dioxide leaving the body and the oxygen still in there. So I've had patients who are uh, pretty bad COPD, but they're actually saturating with their home O2 at 94. You know? So it uh, doesn't mean they're in good shape. It just means that uh, their, their body is acidized and we can't tell. Now, being able to measure their entitled CO2, we will be able to see some of these changes and it will help us to uh, determine what is happening with our patients. There is a uh, common thing, and I have done some research and I've seen it in a few places. If you have somebody who has a history of CHF and a history of COPD, um, sometimes you'll get there and they'll be wheezing. And you walk in the door, and so here's a patient. Let's say he's got a, a, a blood pressure of um, 170 over 92, all right? And he's got a heart rate of uh, 120 sinus tack, and he's got a uh, SAO2 of... Um, I don't know. Let's say he's 90%. All right, so here's your patient. And we have wheezes. Now, he's got a history of COPD, 
which would cause wheezes. He's got a history of congestive heart failure, which could initially present as cardiac asthma or wheezes. Um, and we want to know which one it is. All right. Do we give this guy nitrates because his pressure is kind of high and he's maybe going into pulmonary edema and failure? Or do we start dumping albuterol uh, and um, beta agonists into this guy to try to get his lungs opened up? We don't always know. Sometimes it's a crapshoot. Sometimes we try the nitro and it doesn't work, and then we give the albuterol. But giving patients medications they don't need a lot of times is, is not good, and, and in, in most cases, actually, it's, it's pretty bad. So this is the dilemma. Is it cardiac asthma or is it COPD? Well, there is a possible way for us to be able to tell using this stuff. You have a hypoventilation state, and hypoventilation basically just means that there's not enough clearing of oxygen. Generally, this means that the minute volume of air exchange is too low. So either you're breathing too slow or not breathing at all, or you have decreased movement of air because you are air trapping uh, with a COPD or something like that. Um, and then we're going to see, a. Uh, eventually you will see when this gets bad, a subsequent increase in the ETCO2 because you're trapping uh, the CO2 in there. Our job is to fix the minute volume. So either breathe for the patient, um, breathe deeper for the patient, give them uh, some kind of bronchodilators, fix the issue so that they are exchanging air properly. But that is the definition of hypoventilation. Now, we just talked about COPD patients. Uh, remember, when you first start to breathe out, you have this dead space air that comes out first. In patients who are trapping air, COPD or asthma, they're not able to get air out quickly. So your waveform, instead of being a nice square like it usually is, uh, looks like this. It's what's called a shark fin presentation. It's a sloped expiratory upstroke, and that is indicating that there's a difficult time for the patient getting air out. It's trapped in their alveoli because of atelectasis, or it is um, trapped in their lungs because of bronchospasms. And either way, you're going to get this shark fin. It's a bad sign for your patients, and we want to kind of fix that. Um, the way you can determine, in many cases, a CHF, early CHF from a COPD or with wheezing is that uh, there is no air trapping with CHF. It's just a simple exchange of oxygen that's not happening because there's fluid starting to form in the lungs, and it sounds like wheezing. So generally, you're going to see a CHF patient with a square capnogram. Generally, all right, and then and all the things to talk about medicine in general doesn't mean it's going to be that way always. But in general, if you aren't sure, throw that thing on your patient. If they're wheezing and you see this and they don't look like they're trapping any air, it's probably a CHF. Maybe you want to go the route of um, nitrates rather than uh, starting right off the bat and giving them nebulizers, um, or use your nitrates in addition to nebulizers by our protocols. This is a video of shark fin. Uh, what I did was I simulated not being able to get air out by um, squeezing my hand over the end of the uh, endotracheal uh, fixture for the uh, entyl CO2. So what you're seeing there is exactly what I was talking about. All right, I'm having a hard time blowing the air out, and it's looking like a slope as it goes up. And something else to pay attention to on this particular video. Check out my ETCO2. I was previously setting at around 30. Now I'm up to 40. Why? Because I'm trapping carbon dioxide. You'll see this kind of shark fin situation here. It's not a square. It's going up like that, and that's what's happening. So as you give albuterol to a patient um, and treat them for these things, you will hopefully see a change in the um, the capnogram. Here is an actual patient in uh, asthma. All right, so this is an asthmatic patient who initially had a very low uh, ETCO2, and, and this is classic shark fin here. Okay, we're getting slow expiratory upstroke, and it looks like little shark fins there. Um, what you see is also a low ETCO2. This patient's hyperventilating because they're trying to get air in and out, and they're and they're blowing off a lot of carbon dioxide, but they're also retaining a lot of carbon dioxide as well. Um, as soon as we start treating them, you can see that the patient gets worse initially. So this is um, the first treatment. They still have a shark fin, but now they're blowing out an increased amount of carbon dioxide. Now this could be because the treatment is starting to work and because the lungs are opening up, so it's starting to dump out some of that uh, carbon dioxide that's in their system. And this eventually, it will normalize, hopefully, and this one says after two, uh, two combi nebs, um, and this looks like about 
uh, a little over a half hour later, now you have a nice normal capnogram. All right, this is back to square just about. This patient is uh, giving us an ETCO2 of somewhere around 30, 35, and that's where we want to be. So um, we talked about trend earlier. This is a good trend, all right? This is going to help us decide if our treatments are effective or not. In this case, they absolutely look like they are effective. We have a return of a normal waveform after starting off with a pretty crappy one. So the trend is going to help us decide whether or not what we're doing is actually making a difference for our patients. If you find a patient who has low ETCO2, there's a couple things that can be happening here. This can be any kind of acidosis, and usually it's a metabolic thing in nature. So any increased acidosis, for example, a uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, increases the acidity of the blood, which causes you to hyperventilate, which is going to cause you to blow off lots of CO2. So that CO2 is going to start to drop because uh, they're hyperventilating. Um, and really any kind of metabolic process that makes you acidic is going to result in a low ETCO2. Um, rapid breathing is going to cause that. Now, we talk about hyperventilation, and most of us have this stigma of psychogenic hyperventilation, where uh, the patient's nuts, they're having a, a panic attack, and they're breathing, breathing too fast. Okay, that's fine. If you slow them down and you can get them to relax a little bit, that's good. But keep in mind, they may be having a metabolic problem. All right, If your patient's got a, a diabetic history and you feel like they're having a panic attack and hyperventilation, it might be a good time now to take blood sugar. Because if their blood sugar is high or over 500 on our uh, on our glucometer, they may not be having a hyperventilation syndrome. They may be actually hyperventilating because they're acidotic. So uh, again, don't blow off people who are breathing fast as all psychogenic. There are other processes in the body that can cause you to breathe fast because you're acidotic. We don't want to blow that off. So using the capnogram is helpful there, and waveform is going to tell us a little bit. Um, if you have a patient who you think is psychogenic hyperventilation and you calm them down and you start to see their respiration slow and their waveform goes back to a nice 35 to 45 and things are good, then we can say, okay, sure, that's great. We have a patient who is hyperventilating. We talked them down in life as well. But don't assume that's what it is uh, because in the meantime, your patient's not being treated for what they need. Uh, you may see this where the... Uh, ETCO2 continuously drops because of the blowing off of the carbon dioxide, so that is one of the things you might see for hyperventilation as well. As we wrap up here, there's a couple other things to consider, and per Dr. Walters from our medical director, uh, these are things that uh, we shouldn't be too overly focused on, but they're good to know and, and something that we might be able to uh, put into play at some point in the future to do a little better stuff. Uh, sepsis and pulmonary embolism and the use of ETCO2. All right. Sepsis. If you're not familiar with this term, sepsis is a uh, systemic infection, and basically this is an infection that starts in place and then goes systemic. It's a completely systemic response uh, to uh, some kind of infection that's happening in the body. They have what's called SERS criteria, and the SERS criteria are things they would use to uh, increase their suspicion of a possible sepsis patient. And the SERS criteria that we normally look at come down to this. Uh, a body temperature of less than 36 Celsius or greater than 38, a heart rate of greater than 90 beats per minute, a uh, tachypnea, so a high respiratory rate with a greater than 20 breaths per minute, and then a white blood cell count that is less than 4,000 or greater than 1,200. So these are the uh, criteria in the hospital that they would use to look at a uh, patient and to try to decide if they are septic. Now, lots of people have heartbeats greater than 90 and it's not always from sepsis. Um, they may have tachypnea for other reasons. They may have tachypnea because they are um, acidotic from something else, or they may have COPD and be breathing fast all the time. We're not going to know the white blood cell count here, and we're only possibly going to know the temperature. So if you see two or more SERS criteria, that generally is enough for us to suspect that there is a possibility of um, sepsis in a patient. And one of the other things that points to that is a low ETCO2 on these patients. So they're breathing hard. You put them on here, they've got a range of 25-ish. Uh, you can see this patient had a range of 25-ish. This is another sign that might support the fact that the patient is in sepsis. However, it doesn't mean that they are in sepsis. Um, you can have people with other metabolic conditions that are breathing fast and blowing off a lot of CO2, and they may have a low um, ETCO2. So this can help us identify a patient who is possibly in sepsis, but we need our SERS criteria. And some of that SERS criteria is stuff we're going to have to get at the hospital, especially the white blood cell count. So sepsis, we can get a little help with the ETCO2 uh, under suspicion of that, but um, it's not going to be a for sure always. 
The other thing that happens uh, with ETCO2 is uh, pulmonary embolism. So we get a deep vein thrombosis, it gets pushed to the heart, the heart pumps it out and goes to the lungs and we get some blockages, right? This is what's called a VQ mismatch. We have air going in and out, but we have areas of the lung that is not getting um, perfusion. And when that happens, um, you don't get exchange of oxygen and, and CO2 there. So uh, what they will see in a patient with pulmonary embolism very often is a low and tidal CO2. So let's say you get a patient who's got a sudden onset of chest pain, shortness of breath, they drop their O2 sap, but their lungs are clear bilaterally, they're not having a STEMI. Um, you can put the ETCO2 on that patient. And technically speaking, well, I'll use a dominant word, technically, if uh, you have a normal ETCO2, you can almost rule out a pulmonary embolism because the pulmonary embolism is generally going to result in a change in e co 2 so you can almost rule it out but not always and again something a doctor is going to have to look at anyways but it might let you relax a little bit and say okay we probably don't have a pe um, since we have a decent etco2 um, if you have an abnormal etco2 the problem with ruling it in is that there are a lot of other processes in the body that can cause shortness of breath and chest pain and um, low saturations of oxygen and low uh, ETCO2. So we can't really rule it in. They need other tests to verify that it's there, but sometimes a normal or relatively normal ETCO2 will tell us that uh, the patient does not probably have a pulmonary embolus or that if they do, it's a minor one. A finding you may see with a patient is called uh, elevated baseline. This is a, a patient who is rebreathing carbon dioxide for some reason. So they're breathing out, and before they can clear out the ET tube or anything else, they're breathing back in, and they're starting to build up levels as they do that. Um, this generally is a situation where you have a fault with your equipment. So if the patient's on a non rebreather, perhaps uh, they're not clearing the mask fully when they breathe out, and they're rebreathing some of the carbon dioxide. Um, the valves on your vent equipment or mask may be jammed and aren't letting the uh, air that's being expelled completely escape from the system. So uh, in this case, you can sometimes use a, a BVM to, to normalize the waveform and try to get back to normal, but this is a person who is rebreathing their carbon dioxide and then the baseline just keeps going up and up and up. On a vent transfer, uh, patients are generally going to be sedated. So sedation is nice because it keeps your patients nice and quiet and they don't have any uh, issues during a transport. However, if you start to see uh, little clefts here in your waveforms, uh, this can indicate a uh, attempt to take a spontaneous uh, respiration around the ventilations that the, uh, the vent is giving. Um, and it's an indicator of neurologic activity in post-cardiac arrest. So if you're bagging somebody and, you're having, and you see these, it could indicate the patient is trying to take a breath. Um, this is also a uh, kind of a solemn indicator that your uh, sedated vent patient is beginning to regain consciousness, which is something you don't want. So um, this is somebody you may end up doing uh, increased sedation on. Um, and uh, keep in mind, if you have a patient who's on a vent and they're sedated and they become unsedated and start waking up there, some bad things can happen. Uh, first of all, they're going to become scared. They're going to have an elevated blood pressure, sometimes very high. They're going to have an elevated heart rate. It's going to put taxing, uh, you know, stuff on their heart and their respiratory system. Uh, they're also going to uh, maybe become combative and they're going to fight the tube. So they may be breathing out when your ventilator is pushing in. This can cause the patients to desaturate. So uh, this sedation is really, really important. Um, and if you end up on a long distance transfer with a patient who's got some kind of sedation running or you've been given the option, you're going to want to call the doctor pretty much immediately and say, hey, the patient's waking up. We need to resedate this kid or this guy. And um, that, that's a sign that uh, you may be needing to do that. So, as we're ending up here after a very long, long journey, um, by REMAC protocol, uh, waveform capnography must be used for every intubated patient. This is going to both give us uh, indications of ROSC, indications of loss of pulses, and tell us that our tube's in the right place. Um, it is a paramount responsibility to ensure that the ETCO2 monitoring is there, but any level provider can attach this stuff. So uh, don't be afraid to help out your medic partners if you want to grab the equipment out for them, especially if they forget. Uh, please remember that a sudden loss of waveform is likely due to uh, a loss of pulses or a uh, displacement of your uh, ET tube. A consistently low ETCO2 can indicate poor CPR, um, or if you have good CPR going on, a consistently low ETCO2 in a cardiac arrest is a good predictor of mortality after 20 minutes. Uh, waveform trend will tell us if the patient is improving or worsening with the treatment that we're giving. Um, and there's the big one. Use capnography on all patients with respiratory complaints. We definitely want to be able to get a waveform and uh, take a look at what they're doing on their 
treatment plan and how well things are progressing. That is the end of me talking. Um, there is a quiz, as I said, to, you can take online to get your CME credit. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, hopefully you're being a little more comfortable with uh, the capnography monitoring, and uh, we'll see you out in the field. Be safe out there. <laughs>